First of all, I would like to say thank you for all of you for taking time out today to come to the Why It Matters stage. You know, it's certainly a big crowd and I appreciate that. And once again, I want to thank DARPA for the opportunity to come here and uh, share a little bit about my story and how passionate I am about you know, investment in science and technology because at the end of the day that saves lives and helps us get our mission done. In August 19th of 2006, I had the absolute greatest job in the entire world. And I'm going to take a few minutes this afternoon to talk to you about a very personal story about my injury, but more importantly, my recovery and how science and technology and developments from 10 to 15 to 20 years ago not only saved my life, but allowed me to continue to serve my country. So August 19, 2006, as I said, I had the greatest job on the entire planet. It was a special forces commander of an operational detachment alpha, forward deployed to support operation enduring freedom. <coughs> this particular deployment, we were in central Afghanistan, Aruzgan province. And one particular combat reconnaissance patrol that we were on, uh, we had some intelligence, there were 20 to 25 enemy combatants within a certain valley. Unfortunately for us, the intel that we had was wrong. And when we got to that valley, it was more like 125 to 140 heavily dug in and heavily armed enemy combatants that were well prepared and organized into a three-sided, uh, very complex ambush uh, with, armed with heavy weapons, a multitude of RPGs and small arms. Needless to say, things got pretty ugly pretty quick for my team on the ground. We had between 12 and 15 U.S. service members at the time. Almost the same number, maybe a little bit more, of host nation uh, counterpart Afghan soldiers. Within the first 15 minutes of that engagement, an RPG round struck uh, in the vicinity of my left hand. And the blast immediately took my left hand off below the wrist. Shrapnel from the blast hit me in the face and the neck, took out my left eye, bits of metal, went into the front of my neck, back of my neck. My right arm had caught enough shrapnel to split it open from the elbow to the chest. I had a brachial arterial bleed in my right arm, which was the major life-threatening injury. And if not for the courage and the heroism, the training and the capability of my team sergeant and my 18 Delta Special Forces medic being able to fight their way through about 75 meters of uncovered terrain through heavy enemy fire to get to my position. And I wouldn't be here today and I'll be forever thankful for those two gentlemen. So as I said, my injuries were very significant, but they uh, were able to put me back together uh, to the point that they were able to stop the arterial bleed, put a tourniquet on my left hand, hold my neck together as best they could, uh, all while continuing to fight the enemy. This is what I looked like four days later when I finally got to Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And as you can see, my injuries were pretty severe. Oddly enough, the number one piece of feedback I get when I show this picture is people who tell me, wow, you didn't have any gray hair back then. <laughs> Which is not really what I'm looking for, but I understand I'm a little older, that's okay. But what I would like to point out in this photograph is you can see my arms, obviously left hand gone, right arm shredded up, face and neck severely damaged. But what I would like to point out is if you look at everything that was covered by my body armor, for those of you who are familiar, everything inside of my arms, from my neck down to my abdomen, and you can't see from the photo, but everything above my eyebrows and my head, are completely clean. 
So certainly a big win for people who developed that technology years ago. Um, and it's absolutely putting, keeping guys alive on the battlefield. So as you can see, I started to get a little bit better. And there are several things that every soldier needs. One of those things is to be properly motivated. And I've always been a pretty motivated guy on my own. But when you get to those low points in your life, you need that extra kick. I'll tell you, I had a lot of those, and one of them who's in the crowd today is Mr. Fred Downs. Mr. Downs, if you could raise your hand. Mr. Downs worked for the VA at the time, lost his left arm in Vietnam, and came to the hospital, and I clearly remember, even in the sedated state that I was in at the time, being motivated by the things that Mr. Downs had been able to accomplish in his life regardless of the loss of limb. So Mr. Downs, I just want to say thank you for that. I appreciate it. And, and you'll also notice that Mr. Downs is wearing one of the latest and greatest DARPA upper body extremity prosthetics, the DECA arm, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and they've got a booth set up in the back, and then technology today is going to push forward to the point where you know, people will be able to do what we never imagined, even after injuries. One of the other things I'd like to share, and this is going to be difficult for me, but I think it's a valid point when it comes to motivation. About this time in the hospital, which is probably, I don't know, four to six weeks post-injury, uh, they pulled the metal out of my neck, they were able to bone suture my trachea back together, they were, the holes in my esophagus had healed to the point where they pulled the feeding tube out and I could talk a little bit again. My son, who was three years old at the time, was first brought to the hospital. And they had told my son, your dad was injured in the war, he lost his hand, he lost his eye, his right arm got messed up. But he's okay, and we're going to take you to the hospital. So I remember they brought my son into the hospital, and uh, they picked him up, and they, they put him down in the bed with me. And I was right about this point. And the first thing my son, my three, like only a three-year-old can do, my son looked up at me, and he said, Daddy, where are your teeth? It's all my teeth were front teeth. They were all knocked out from the glass. And I looked at him, and he said, Son, I'm going to get some new teeth. Don't worry about that shook his head, and at the time my right arm was suspended in the air to promote uh, just some uh, drainage and, and everything else, and my son leaned over to my right arm, as I said, only like a three-year-old can do, and he gave me the biggest kiss in the world right in the middle of that nasty stitch line. And then he looked up at me and he said, all better now, Daddy, let's play baseball. <laughs> And I will never forget the words or the expression on my son's face that I took as if a old man, quit whining, quit feeling sorry for yourself, get out of this bed and let's play. And at that moment, that's all I cared about was being able to recover to the point that I could get out of that bed and play baseball with my son. Of course, I remind him that to this day. And uh, if he's out there playing baseball and he gets hurt a little bit, he's whining about his ankle or, oh, daddy, this hurts or that hurts, I remind him, I said, son, do you remember what you told me when I was in the hospital? So there's two sides to every coin. There's not a lot of sympathy in the Dwyer house. <laughs> One of the other things that soldiers in this situation need is the support structure around them. And I was fortunate to have been blessed with a phenomenal family. Uh, the guys in the unit who I just couldn't ask for more. Uh, wonderful support staff. Uh, the creativity of the prosthetists that worked with me in creating new devices. But I'd like to talk a little bit about my wife. I'm fortunate I married a saint. And I started getting a little better in the hospital. And one day I told my wife, I said, you know what, I don't think I'm gonna get out of the Army. I think I'd like to stay in the Army 
and do what I can to continue to contribute. And my wife rolled her eyes at the back of her head and kind of shook it off and she looked at me and she said, whatever makes you happy. And as things progressed more towards the end, I uh, was going back to Fort Bragg and I said, you know what? I've got this fancy new prosthetic and it's working out for a lot of different things. And I'm going to go back to Fort Bragg. I'm going to convince the Army that it's a great idea to continue to let me jump out of perfectly good airplanes. Uh, and I'd like to stay Special Forces. I'd like to stay operational. And I'd like to redeploy back to Afghanistan. My wife rolled her eyes in the back of her hand and she shook it off and she looked at me and she said, whatever makes you happy. Uh, unfortunately, because of the work of some of the great prostheticians and their creativity and their ability to stick with me when I would come to them and I would say, Jamie, uh, I was in the gym again today and I was doing some deadlifts and I, my hand fell off, so we need to make this wrist joint stronger. And he would say, well, how much were you doing? I would say, oh, I don't know, 150 pounds to whatever. And he was like, well, that's not designed for that. I said, great, let's design it for that. And every single time that he rides that, we're going to make it happen. And I have been able to stay on airborne status. I have been able to stay operational. I was able to go back to 3rd Special Forces Group. And in 2011, I was able to take a Special Forces company and redeploy to Afghanistan in an operational position. Um, and, and it can all be attributed to what I had around me. The motivating factors, the support factors, the creativity that people are willing to invest in what we can do, and as, as the director said, I think yesterday in her opening remarks, to change the impossible. And that's what they did for me. They were able to change the impossible. One of the things that I like to tell people is I've been given a very unique opportunity in my life to show everyone that I work with and everyone that I'm around that your desire and your commitment and your intestinal fortitude will always be more important than having a full complement of body parts. And there is no disability which cannot be overcome as long as you're willing to continue to push yourself and continue to drive and surround yourself with phenomenal people. So this photograph was taken in 2011 as I was getting ready to get on the airplane to go back to Afghanistan. With my family, with my son who is now 12, my daughter who is now 8, and my saint of a wife. And at the end of the day, to me, this is why it matters. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. yesterday who asked me a question that I actually, I didn't have a good answer for it, so I'd like to answer it now, and he's probably not here. Uh, but he asked me, he said, what was the most challenging thing? And my answer at the time was, oh man, there was a whole lot of challenging things, and uh, you know, depth perception with my eye, and pain management with the level of my injuries, and then adjusting to prosthetic, and doing all of the different things, learning to play the piano again. It's not true, I don't play the piano. <laughs> but as I thought about it last night, the most difficult thing for me has not been adjusting to what is now for me the new normal, which is totally fine. The most difficult thing has been changing others' perceptions about what they believed I could do. Because there are a whole lot of folks out there that believe, hey, you, you are in this position and you're, we're going to put limitations upon you. And showing others that those limitations don't apply as long as you can push yourself through those limits. So that, that would be my answer to the most challenging thing. But please ask me this. Here. First of all, thank you. It's really overwhelming. How do you control your heart? Uh, that's, a, that's a phenomenal question. So this is, this is pretty, like I said, this is not the latest and greatest of uh, you know, technology when it comes to prosthetic arms, but it's what works for me because of the durability and the fact that I know it's always going to function. Uh, so, so this hand uh, is completely body powered with no electronics. Uh, this cable that's wrapped here, it goes around 
my bag, which is attached to a harness that goes around my other shoulder. So when I close this hand, it's just me pushing that cable forward with my other shoulder. So it's, it's, it's very simple. Uh, advantage is being, like I said, the durability, uh, the functionality of your brakes. I can take it in the garage with a Dremel and some parachute cord and some 100 mile an hour tape for those of you who know what that is uh, and fix just about anything I've got. Um, so, yeah, so it's very, very simple. You, the most impressive thing is, and I don't have my tools today to do this, but there's my juggling demonstration that I do want to do. I'm also joking about that. <laughs> Thank you, that's a great question. When a soldier has to get a prosthetic, what, what do they worry about? So, there are, uh, you know, certainly differences between guys who lose legs and guys who lose arms, uh, but the way I like to, to kind of address that topic is, uh, I'll tell you, the guys that were in the hospital with me and the guys that I've seen throughout the years and in the Special Operations Command who've lost limbs, uh, to a man, every single one of them, regardless of their injury. Okay, I'm missing both legs and I'm missing an arm and I only got half a face left. Uh, and I only have one question for you, Doc. How can I get back to the point where I can contribute to my team and keep doing the mission? And that's a pretty powerful thing for me to look around the guys I work with and know that I get a chance to go to work every day with guys like that who are willing to die for each other and to die for their mission. Could I have um, everybody who spoke back up here? Still here. So, as technologists and uh, you know, ultimately trained to help you find yourselves, for for wounded veterans, for 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 anybody that that comes back or that and is wounded, what what could we do for you to, to help you more? Um, so that is, well, that is a, there is a really long, complicated answer to that. Uh, I'll try to give you the, the Cliff Notes version. Uh, and like I said before, one of the things that every soldier needs, but especially soldiers at a point like this, right, they need to be motivated, they need to be supported, and that's the big one, right? Like supported, and, and I can't even tell, I mean, the, the amount of support that I've had, the amount of support that our country offers, uh, to guys that not only have been injured, but to the force as a whole, has absolutely been incredible. It's very humbling all the time for that. So, um, And then all the technology that's being developed now, and I can talk about that for a long time, but that's the short version. 